All right, welcome to week 13. We are wrapping things up to my insanely huge audience. I wish I could turn the camera around just to shame the ones that didn't bother show up. Um, oh, there we go, we got just stragglers. Um, so the last topic is transactions. Uh, this, they used to have to be a lab on this and we dropped it um, because of how the timing went. It was causing too much stress to the students and apparently too much stress to the people grading. Um, so transactions is actually, a, can be a really complex topic or a really simple topic. <clears throat> and what's important thing about transactions is the modern data world wouldn't function without them. And of course we've got this happening. There we go. So a transaction is a unit of work that changes the state of a database. Now, an insert changes the state of the database, an update, a delete, a single command. Those are transactions. However, when people are actually using the phrase transaction as far as a database is concerned, or a database server is concerned, we're referring to a sequential group of statements that need to be performed as a single unit of work. That's actually a really uh, long statement, but essentially it's saying that Let's say we need to do multiple operations at once. All of them have to succeed for it to be a valid transaction. If all the changes work, it's successful. Otherwise, the transaction fails and it gets rolled back. Um, so, of course, this supposedly was updated by someone, but they never updated it. Um, they did, but they forgot this part. So. MySQL, when you work with MySQL, uh, transactions end explicitly when they encounter a commit or a rollback. It's not just MySQL, it's all database servers. Um, MySQL, on the other hand, what is different is if they hit a DDL statement, uh, the transaction is implicitly completed. Um, Postgres, on the other hand, allows DDL commands as part of a transaction. Now, before I talk about this, I will actually describe basically what transactions actually do. Now, when you think about um, transferring money from one bank account to the other, this is the one that everybody gets. So how do you think a money gets transferred from one bank account to the other? So you've got two bank accounts, you open up your app. So I'm going to log into BMO, say I need to transfer you know, some beer money for the weekend from my savings to my checking. What do you think happens? Yeah, so that's how many steps though? There, well, minimum, it, well, there's four, there's four or five actual database transactions, but there's two steps. Different banks do it differently. Say BC does it different than BMO, but in the end, they all do the exact same thing. One account gets a debit, one account gets a credit. Now, the banking industry is the ones that push for transactions. Because what would happen is, for example, um, BMO debits than credits. CIBC actually credits then debits. Um, BMO has always been more conservative in how they give money out to people. Theoretically, yes, but they actually do a debit first, which is fine. So let's say we got our savings account. There's 150 bucks. We're going to transfer $50 to our checking account. Savings account minus 50. Checking account plus 50. Cool. Both sides still add up to the original numbers. What happens if it fails partway through? Minus 50 on your savings account and nothing shows up in your checking account because the transaction failed. Something just went wrong, you know solar flare, whatever, uh, random bit flip, could be anything. And at that point, you're out 50 bucks and there's no proof of where it went. It just disappeared. A record was put in that $50 went away from one account, but there's no information where it went after that. What a transaction will do is before you start transferring the money, it'll go begin the transaction, minus 50, Plus 50, then there's a what they call an explicit commit. So at the end of that transaction, the 
code will actually tell the database server, this was valid, you can now commit. If it never reaches the commit, the transaction is rolled back as if it never even happened. So suddenly the $50 went minus 50 plus 50, like instantly, you never even notice it. That's what transactions do. It's to make sure that your database stays consistent. And now we're gonna talk about the um, acronym. And you know, this may or may not be on the exam. This particular acronym might be on the exam. So just putting it out there. Characteristics of transactions. So there's an acronym called ACID. And ACID is the acronym uh, specifically describes the four properties of a proper transaction. It's atomic. This refers to the fact that every statement within the group is required to be performed successfully. So you could actually have 25 steps in whatever you're trying to do. But the thing is that those 25 steps are considered one task, one unit of work. Any piece of those 25s fails, it's not, that means that that whole step failed. When I'm talking about transferring 50 bucks from one account to the other, that's simple because it's only two steps. I also sometimes use the example of getting your ass out of bed in the morning. Alarm goes off, you're in bed. You need to get out of bed. Transaction starts. You start rolling yourself out of bed, whatever steps it takes. You suddenly fail to get out of bed and you decide I like my blankets better for today. Transaction failed. You're rolled back because you're still in bed. Your state has not changed. You roll back into bed. And so any step that fails during the transaction causes that entire transaction to fail. Therefore, it is treated as a single unit of work. Um, I try to think of other things that could count as a single unit of work around the world, um, like actual things that we're used to seeing from day to day. Um, but yeah, that, that getting out of bed is the easiest one that we can relate to. So it means it's all or nothing. Atomic means it's all or nothing. Either it works or it does not. Anything else? No, but sometimes your car doesn't start. So you end up with a rollback state, right? It failed. So you go to start the car, put your foot on the brake, press the button, turn the key, whatever. That theoretically can happen. Or you've got an electric car where there's a wire, there's a short in the battery, car doesn't start. Consistent. The characteristic refers to the fact that the state of the database is modified when a transaction is committed successfully. In other words, the database stays in a consistent state. It's consistent before the transaction starts. It's consistent once the transaction completes. If all the steps of the transaction succeed, therefore it will be consistent. In other words, we'll go back to our bank account example. Minus 50 on your savings account, and it fails to add $50 to your checking account. The database is no longer consistent because $50 has disappeared. Therefore, to be consistent, it has to have the two accounts have to have the same total. So if you got 50 here and 150 there, the total is 200. When you're done, it should still be 200. Yes. Uh, usually it's the, ad, the, the, the application. The application will have some logic in there to, help to stop you from, yeah, it won't let you. Like you look, you know, when you look at your bank account and you go, I want to transfer money out of my savings account. Exactly. That's the application. They, they probably, they, they get, since it's displaying the amount on screen for you that you have in your account that you're about to transfer, it knows that it's there or not. Um, so consistency means that the database stays consistent with whatever that means. Like depending on the application, the concept of consistent may be different. Isolation. Uh, this characteristic means that every transaction happens in its own bubble. So you start a long running transaction whatever changes you're making only affect you. Anything outside of this bubble, it's as if the transaction is not even happening. It's invisible to the world. Isolation 
uh, means also that different statements are transparent to each other. I will actually do a demonstration once I'm done talking about transactions so you guys can actually visually see what happens. Durability. Durability happens once a transaction is complete and it's been written to disk, it can never be undone. That's the meaning of durability. It's permanent. Once it's, once it's committed, it's never changing ever again. Um, so even if like the server crashes, there's a hardware failure, whatever, whatever state it was at that point, if it's been written to the disk, it's permanent. So why are my slides talking about MySQL? I even downloaded the new ones. And, okay, I don't know where it went. Yeah, yeah, that's not what I was looking for. I had an updated copy, and I think what happened is OneDrive didn't update it on my laptop. So I'm running with the old one. It's fine. With the, but I'm talking about the Postgres-specific ones. These say MySQL. No. No, I was looking for the supposedly updated week 13. There it is. No, that's not, God, I hate the new outlook. That's the one I needed. Slide 42, here we go. Slide 37, there's even less slides. All right, so he just, yeah, he took out all the concepts, which is fine. Um, yeah, there's that, good, that one's there. Um, yeah, that's there. So basically there's four slides of MySQL that line up with this. So in Postgres, when you, be you begin a transaction, you can use the begin keyword. Begin says start keeping track of the transaction. When you're done, you're gonna either use commit, which writes it to the disk, rollback, which undoes it. Um, and Postgres is cool because it lets you actually um, do the DDL as part of a transaction. So you can actually create a table as part of a transaction, which is nifty because maybe you're creating the table, you need to create four tables and suddenly the third table fails, you want it all to fail, which is something that it can do. And the last item was the save point. Um, in database servers, you can actually create save points in the middle of a transaction. So you can go steps one, two, three, four, Mark it as a save point, step five, six, seven, you know where seven fails. You can actually roll it back to a save point and then commit from there. So you can do partial commits with a save point. Um, allows you partial rollbacks. And I'm just going to do the demo. It'll make so much more sense. Okay. So I'm just using my example database that I had earlier that had the, the card, the face cards and stuff in it. The So the suites and the face values. Now, you'll notice that I have two connections right here. No, don't do that. And this table's in the same state it was when I did the demo on uh, the Cartesian joins. What I'm going to do is, what you guys are used to seeing is you'll see, um, what you've experienced so far is I go insert, it ran, I come to my other tab, and it's there. So you guys have witnessed this before. This is basically what you guys have been doing so far. But if I run it as a transaction, so I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to go, I'm going to insert a queen. But before I do that, I'm going to hit. 
and I'm going to hit run. You'll see in this one, it says it inserted. But if I go to my other connection, there's no queen. But if I go back to my first connection, let's start. This one has a queen. So what's happening is each connection is operating independently from each other. When you begin a transaction, everything is isolated to itself. Nobody else in the rest of the world can see what's happening inside of that transaction, and the transaction can't see what's happening outside itself. Now, most database transactions are almost instantaneous. Like you're creating an order. You're, so you've got a shopping cart, and the person checks out, and you want to create the order. You have to be able to create the order and add the order lines. Otherwise, it's not going to be a valid order. So that would be a transaction where you create the order. And then you might insert five things into order lines, and then you would commit. While that's happening, nobody else should be able to see what's happening in there. So now I could go here and go uh, commit. And I'll just it'll say commit. Great. Now if I go back to my other connection, now the queen is there because I committed the other one. So now it's been written to the disk. It's out of temporary storage. The other thing that's kind of nifty is if I go um, begin and I go um, delete from face value. Wow, good typing, Dan. Where FV is equal to king. And I go go. It says it's deleted. There, is, It's still in the other one. Now, if I were to roll back, actually, let me go really quick here. Go select star. That's not a star. From face value. See, the king is gone. If I go roll back, And I and I go do the select star again. The king is back because the rollback says the transaction failed. Let's undo what I just tried to do. This is the closest to undo you will ever have in a database. Oracle is cool because by default it has auto commit turned off. It's the only database server I've ever used that has auto commit turned off. So Postgres, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server. IBM DB2, they have what's called auto commit, which is what you guys have been experiencing so far. You do an insert, it's there. You do a delete, it's gone. Oracle's the other way around where you actually have to explicitly tell it to commit every single time you do anything. It's more forgiving, but it's more code. Um, now, the last thing that's kind of nifty is this. So I'm going to go um, begin transaction. And I'm going to go uh, update FV set um, update, no, update face value set FV equal to Jack, where FV is equal to Queen. And I'm going to hit run. So transactions doing its thing. It's cool. It's all good. I can even come in here and go uh, select star from face value. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. There's going to be all. I'm having some major chair keyboard interface problems today. Current transaction is aborted. Interesting. Because I had an error. So if I go select star from face value. It's not letting me do it, so I'd have to go roll back, hit go, and go select star from face value. I hit go. So my cards are still there. King and queen are still there. So I am now going to go begin. I'm gonna, let me just undo all this. Begin this, and I'm going to go select star from face value so you can all see. I hit go. You can see queen became jack. 
nifty. Now let's just say, and this one here, queen still a queen. I could go up here and go update um, face value set fv equal to 10 where fv is equal to queen. But last time I did this, this was on MySQL, so I'm not sure if this is actually going to do what I expect it to do. I'm going to hit go. Okay, too long for that. Let's make it a nine. So notice how the query is now hung. It's hung because it's waiting for the other one to release the transaction. Because I'm playing on the same with the same one, right? I'm one of them I'm renaming it the queen to Jack. And in the other, I'm trying to rename the queen to nine. What's happening is the queen row has been locked. It cannot be touched until the transaction's finished. So now I'm going to go commit. And I won't even be able to go to the other tab fast enough to actually catch it. I'm going to commit. Boom, that happened. If I come over here, you'll see query return successfully 34 seconds, but it notice it says update zero. Why is it update zero? Because the queen became a jack in the other one, therefore queen no longer exists. So this just showing you guys the isolation of transactions between one and the other and how some of the side effects that can occur. Realistically, there's a lot more transactions in this. Um, I could do an entire lecture just on transactions. Like, not seven slide lecture. A, you know, 30 odd slide lecture that covers, you know, some of the weird checkpointing and stuff like that. Okay. So, that was literally the end of the new content. These guys showed up just in time to leave. Um, not quite 10 minutes left. Okay, so now that I've finished talking about transactions, so I'm gonna bring up what's, how the, what the exam setup is gonna be, okay? All right, starters, it's A120. Except if you're not in my class, then you may not be in A120. Check access. Uh, because I know for a fact that some of them are in C346. Okay. I'm actually going to take this and post it right on Brightspace. So you don't need to take pictures. I'm actually going to put it on Brightspace for you guys. So Saturday, December 9th at 8 a.m. As if I haven't been seeing this enough and how much that's going to suck us. That means I need I need to be here for 7 a.m. to set up the exams because the door is not going to be unlocked. I'm going to have to call security and get them to come unlock the door. And it always takes them half an hour. We've actually had exams start late because of that. Okay. It covers weeks 9 to 13. Only the second half of the semester. Anything that happened in the first half, you could just pretend it never even happened. Because I'm sure for about three quarters of the people sitting in here right now probably don't remember a thing. So it's good. All right. It's 35 multiple choice questions done on Scantron with 10 write the SQL type questions. Hide writing must be legible. If I can't read what you wrote, I give you a zero. I have 147 exams to hand grade. If I can't read it, TFB. You can say it out loud because it won't get recorded if you say it. There we go. Thank you. After seeing what the midterms looked like, some of you may need to practice printing. I shit you not. I had one person, and I think either they thought I was stupid, but they literally wrote. That's how many points they got for that. If your answer looks like you're going to get a zero. I have to be able to read it. I'm not here to grade your handwriting. I'm here to grade your SQL. And if I can't read it, you might as well not have done it. And here's the catch. Most of the write the SQL type questions are worth more than one point. Like there's a significant number of points on that. Like 
two to four points per question. It's right on the exam paper. You'll know right away when you look at it how many points that's going to be when you don't know how to answer the question. No, there's nothing quite that bad. There's some joints. I mean, come on, that's like one of the big components. Yeah, so here's the breakdown. So the breakdown of the multiple choice. And these numbers are about, because some of some questions might fall into multiple categories, so I just picked the closest. General SQL, such as aliases, sorting, like doing a proper order by, that kind of thing. There's four of those. Uh, the select statement, this is like column selection functions and joins. There's eight. Questions that involve the where clause, such as, you know, how are pred what order are the predicates matched in and or how do you group predicates together and or how do you do a pattern match? Um, six questions on aggregates. So these are, you know, if, you, if it's this kind of function, what does it do? How do you filter based on the results of the aggregate? That kind of stuff. Three questions on indexes. We talked about indexes two weeks ago. Three questions on views. We talked about that last week. Transactions. I just finished talking about it. Um, I'm going to put up both sets of slides for you guys just to be on the safe side. Um, but from what I saw, you just need to know, you know what the acronym stands for and what the command is to start a transaction, the command to commit a transaction, that kind of thing. All right, the written section for everybody's enjoyment. There are seven questions about the select statement where you're gonna write a select statement. There are two views and one statement about creating an index. You are going to write out the command.